Soll ich direkt an? Hm? Soll ich direkt an? Nee, ich will es ja schon mal geben, das ah, Mikrofon. Ja. Okay. okay, shall we start? Is everyone set? <coughs> Let's wait until the police is gone. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming to this meetup. Uh, lots of people here I see, that's really nice. I hope, I mean the tables look really packed so I hope there's not the same, same amount of people waiting outside. Um, yeah, so that's, this is the first time we are in the, the Game Science Center here and um, <clears throat> looks like a really nice venue. And, I want to thank the Game Science Center for, for hosting the meetup here, and Leah wants to say some words about what this place actually is. Yes, so hello everybody, and uh, welcome to the Smart Contract Workshop here at Game Science Center. Um, I wish you fun uh, while coding and uh, learning Solidity. Um, so the workshop will end round about uh, 9.30, and afterwards, we will open up the bar and exhibition for you, so uh, feel free to have a beer and uh, mingle at the bar. Um, and also, if you are planning events like networking, live stream and esports events, then you can uh, talk to me afterwards at the bar and we can make plans. So, have fun. Yeah, and also the, uh, the second thank you goes to LivePeer, who are again uh, providing the AV setup here, and they are also live streaming this in a decentralized way to the internet. So that's really cool. Okay. Um, my name is Christian Reitwissner, by the way. Um, and uh, let's start getting to know something about how to write smart contracts on Ethereum. So, did I not test that? Oh, no I didn't. Okay, as I already said, uh, please try to install the MetaMask browser plugin. This is, so that's not the best way to access a blockchain because it's fully centralized, but it's a very, very convenient way to try out Ethereum and to have everything running just in the browser without the need to install anything apart from the plugin, of course. Um, so there is a version for Firefox and Chrome. I'm not sure about Safari. Uh, if you have the option, use Chrome because last time Firefox had some issue, uh, some, some glitches. Okay, um, so yeah, this is about blockchain, right? And uh, blockchains, that's this weird world uh, where you have people buying tons of GPUs and having solved them fully useless problems and people actually rent uh, airplanes so that they can buy GPUs faster than some other uh, people who do the same thing. And there's also this weird thing where you uh, trick people into giving you money and promise to change the world and then in the end you do nothing. Just run away with the money. Is that an issue on my side? And then uh, there are these companies who uh, used to do iced tea, and then they changed their name and introduced blockchain into their name, and the stock price increases, I think, threefold over 10 hours or something like that. Um, yeah, and uh, in the end, uh, you think, you know, perhaps this blockchain thing is something for me. So. Uh, you ask some experts, and if they are real experts, then in 95% of all cases, 
uh, it will turn out that you actually don't need a blockchain. So, but um, there are, of course, legitimate use cases for blockchains, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And, um, and in addition to that, this, uh, this thing that you're wasting electricity in mining is actually not essential. Uh, there is something that is called proof of stake, which can hopefully replace proof of work really soon. And uh, most token sales are scams. But there, so a token sale is actually an interesting way to fund a project if it's done right. So you shouldn't be allowed to just walk away with the money and you can build a token sale such that this is, this is technically not possible. And uh, there are of course some, use, some good use cases for blockchains in general. And let me just uh, show you two example use cases of blockchains where using a blockchain actually makes, really, makes a lot of sense. And then we will start with writing some very simple smart contracts. Um, and one of these use cases is the swarm system. It's a, a decentralized file system, so basically a way to store your data in the cloud, where the cloud just doesn't mean Amazon's uh, compute farm, but uh, um, hard disks donated by users of the system. Um, and it uses a BitTorrent-like system to distribute the data. And, but the, you can't use BitTorrent right away for distributing data because it has, a set, so you can't use it right away for a general <coughs> file storage system because it has some flaws. And these are, unpopular files are deleted after some time, so only popular content stays available. And, uh, What can I do? Okay, just speak louder. You can try that. Um, I mean, do we actually need um, do we actually need speakers for this room? Uh, perhaps you can use the microphone just for the streaming. People in the back, do you need speakers? Sure. Yeah, for now it's fine. Okay, good. So uh, in BitTorrent, there's actually no advantage uh, for you to to upload files. I did improve the situation. Try again, please. There's an echo in the room. <laughs> okay, let's just try to continue. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so in BitTorrent, people send each other files, and uh, usually you only want to have a file. You have no incentive, or you, that there's, you have no gain in sending other people some files. Uh, it's part of the protocol, so people do it, and that's why it works. But uh, yeah, for general file storage system, again, why should you send someone, some other person's backups or their own backups? Um, 
And the blockchain can solve these two problems. Uh, it can pay people for storing files, so it works by you giving someone money for storing your files, and that person basically promises to not delete them and make them available, and this promise is done in a monetary way, so they, they uh, send some money to a locked account, and if that person cannot provide the files when you need them, that the money in that locked account is destroyed, or you might even get a share in that or something like that. So that person is incentivized and also paid for uh, keeping your data available. And then um, even if your data is available, when they just send it in one bit at a time, then that doesn't help much because you need your terabytes of, of backup at some point, and you're also willing to pay for having faster download. So uh, people also pay each other for providing bandwidth. So, and uh, that can be solved by a blockchain. And in general, uh, coming up with these rules, who pays whom in which situations, and whose deposits get destroyed, and so on. This is called uh, crypto economics, or in more general, the, the mathematical branch uh, is called mechanism design. And then another thing that can be nicely solved with blockchains is uh, removing the problem of uh, you having to trust uh, so-called certificate authorities when you browse the web. And so this works whenever you access a website that is encrypted. Um, encryption solves two issues here. The first issue is that uh, you don't want your data to be publicly visible. And the second issue, you want to be sure that you're actually connected to the correct website. This mostly works because you enter the correct name, but uh, if someone is, is, has a tap on your internet connection, then they can uh, pretend to be that person and still intercept your uh, data or even modify it. <clears throat> and uh, this is currently solved by uh, certain organizations, I think there are more than hundred, hundreds of them, who kind of yeah, sign certificates that uh, claim that the person you're currently communicating with is the person behind a certain name. And this is, of course, yeah, really badly flawed because, I mean, there are 100 of these organizations and any of these organizations can give out such a certificate and most of them are, yeah, they are distributed all around the world in various questionable regimes and so on. So, yeah, this, I don't know, doesn't look nice. And um, another problem is that domain ownership itself is not part of the system. So you can, so such a CA can issue a certificate and they are obliged to check that you're the legitimate owner of that domain, but this is not part of the protocol. So if they don't do it, uh, I mean, someone might notice at some point, but they can just skip checking that. And also the, the, the way, so the, yeah, the thoroughness in which this check is done on, uh, yeah, dramatically depends on the specific certificate authority. Now, um, yeah, anyone, everyone can easily create fake certificates on a technical level. And a blockchain-based uh, system and, uh, yeah, for example, the Ethereum name system can go the whole way. So there you can build a system where the allocation of names and the issuing of certificates is part of the same protocol and cannot be faked on a technical level. So um, you can, yeah, the, the, the certificate that is issued will be stored on the blockchain together with uh, the same record that states that you own that, uh, that name in the name system. And uh, of course, this, the same system can be applied to something that is not about DNS, but about anything that, that is kind of ownership of virtual things. And uh, for example, land registries is in a certain way, uh, it, it um, stores ownership of a virtual thing. I mean, it's, it's not, yeah, I mean, virtual thing in the sense that an artificial distribution of land made by humans, so it's kind of virtual. And it is already, 
I mean, it's already a virtual thing that is stored in digital databases in uh, town halls and things like that. And of course, um, here in Germany, this is probably not such a big uh, issue, but uh, um, there are certainly countries where land registries are prone to corruption and uh, a system where, yeah, this is technically impossible might help there. And in general, when, so coming back to this flowchart diagram of earlier, when are blockchains useful? And in my opinion, blockchains are useful if the application you're, you're, you want to add a blockchain to is already digitized. So it doesn't help with, uh, yeah, I don't know, postal services where you have to uh, confirm that you received a package or something like that uh, because this is a purely physical thing. Uh, but land registries, which are already digital, uh, can be used here, where the enforcement of ownership is, of course, a separate thing. And then, uh, yeah, participants have to have conflicting goals. If you don't have conflicting go to goals, you can use a regular database because nobody has an incentive to, to commit fraud. And, uh, yeah, even if you have conflicting goals, at least if all participants have a specific third party who they trust, then there's also no sense in using a blockchain because you can use a database controlled by that third party. So these three things, I think, yes. Uh, application is digitized, participants have conflicting goals, and there's no uh, trusted third party. And then the fourth important thing is uh, you have to be aware that using a blockchain is probably much more costly than not using a blockchain. So these Three things on top have to be so important for you that you can cope with the additional costs that come using the blockchain. Okay, then let's get to the little bit more technical part. Uh, what is Ethereum? Um, yeah, in general, Ethereum is a database. And the interesting thing about Ethereum is that it is a database that is not running on a single computer but uh, it is running on thousands of computers all around the globe. And because of that, it's, yeah, you, you can say it's decentralized. It's also a transparent database, meaning that everyone can take a look at the database, everyone can take a look at modifications of the database. It is manipulation resistant, which means that if the database uh, does not allow a certain modification, then it is very, very hard to do such a modification. Uh, it is also authenticated, which means that any modification to the database, any message sent to the system is signed by, so it's digitally signed by the sender of that message. And it's publicly accessible means uh, everyone who wants can use, not only read the database, but also modify the database. This is also a, a very so a very big simplification, and also everything I will say in the following is probably a very big simplification. So, if you have questions, please ask. I mean, perhaps not now, but uh, later. Um, so, what is a smart contract? Smart contracts are neither smart nor are they contracts. They are just programs running on a database, nothing more, nothing less. And, uh, okay, a little bit more, and this little bit more is that this database is a blockchain, but that's it. Um, you can also think of them as stored procedures in a blockchain-based database if you know what stored procedures are. Uh, okay, that's it for the introductory talk. Um, there are, so let's, let's try to program some smart contracts. There are instructions behind the link there on the top. Um, this is the most annoying part, getting this link to you. <laughs> and, huh? Uh, I could do that. <laughs> and so, who has not yet installed the MetaMask browser plugin? And so, uh, I hope the, the setup of the tables here help, uh, and I would ask everyone to help each other because that way I think it works best. We have some uh, people who will walk around a little and help out, but uh, we have to 
build on you helping each other. Um, so, who, so who has installed the plugin already? Okay, that's almost a compliment. Good, I think everyone will get along. Good. Um, now, um, <clears throat> the next big uh, hurdle we have to cross is um, getting every one of you tested either. So we won't do these, uh, yeah, we won't program smart contracts on the actual Ethereum main network because that would be too expensive. Um, uh, but instead, we will do it on a test net where it's, yeah, that is meant for testing and where the currency ether has no value. Uh, but still, every one of you needs to get some of these uh, of this test net ether, and we will do it on a network called Rinkeby. That's one of the test nets, and I think, yeah, so. I think we will start taking a look at that, and then now I need my second hand. <laughs> so I'm not sure what we do now. Um, perhaps. Do you have something to hang that, or, or shall we try that one again? So, um, <laughs> these are the instructions here. Um, who has set up the, ring, the, the MetaMask plugin? So this is this little fox here, and uh, make sure that it is set to Rinkeby testnet and not to mainnet. Who is at that stage? So at least one person from each table, I think. Good. Now. Um, if you ever plan to use this account also on the mainnet, I would strongly advise you to create separate accounts for each of the networks. And uh, you can also name your account, just put RinkyB there just to make sure so that you not accidentally confuse these uh, 40,000 US dollars for real US dollars or something, or even worse, the other way around. Um, and you can switch the account using that I can hear, and you also can create a new account here. Okay, um, I have another. Oh yes, yeah, someone wanted me to put that on the meetup page. I think I'm not signed in here. Nope. Can someone of you do that, please? Put the link into the meetup page. Maurice? Can you put uh, this link into the meetup page?
or someone else just said? Okay, thanks. So uh, the next step is for you to get uh, ring QB testnet ether. <clears throat> is everyone comfortable with uh, using one of the suggested method methods? Sorry, let's just close this annoying thing. Yeah, we somehow forgot to set up a communication channel for this meetup. Sorry about that. Uh, he's just doing it, so it's fine. He does everything. So, um, <clears throat> So, who does neither use Twitter nor GitHub? Okay, so because these are the two ways to get testnet ether. Um, <clears throat> and so it works why this faucet. Ah, okay, sorry, no, it's not Twitter or GitHub. Um, you can either use one of these three methods or uh, put a comment with your RinkyB testnet account number at the bottom of the, of the gist with the instructions. Does that work for everyone? And then I will send you uh, some of mine. So, oh, we can also use another way that's perhaps most, um, yeah, does that work with guest accounts? Um, just paste your address here. I will put this link into the gist. Okay, that's an unfortunately a rather annoying process uh, in the beginning. This is also a rather annoying process in reality with the actual uh, Ethereum network. But once we're past that, it only gets better. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't use Twitter or any of the other methods to get testnet ether, please request it by pasting your address into that thing. Does that work for you? Can you edit it? So I posted that as a comment below the instructions site. So does it work for anyone? Yeah. Yes? yes? So did you already paste stuff? Because as soon as you paste stuff there, okay. Ah, wonderful. Um, so now we can see how that all works. Um, and so as this is, as I said, a collaborative workshop, uh, people who already have enough testnet ether can try to send some to the other addresses here and then mark them as already sent. So I will now, oh, this is a bit annoying, I'm sorry. 
Um, I think I'll switch my video setup to mirrored. Is that fine? That will change the resolution, I think. Okay, I just copied the address. And <clears throat> um, this is my MetaMask plugin now. I have some testnet ether. I will send some to the address I just copied. Um, I think one ether should be enough. I click next now. Now I uh, see all the information again. Yeah, sorry, I can't increase the size here. Uh, then I click Submit. And now it created a transaction and sent it via this centralized gateway, but still to the decentralized Ethereum network. And I can click here to get more details on a so-called blockchain explorer, which is also a centralized thing, but still better than nothing. And it says it's pending now. This means uh, the transaction has to wait for a so-called miner to include uh, the transaction in the next block. Miners are people who are, yeah, randomly selected by a certain process to determine the order of transaction. And determining the order of transaction is important because there could be conflicting transactions in the sense that uh, I want to send one ether to person A, or I want to send all ether I have in my account to person A and all ether I have to in my account to person B, and those two transactions cannot be valid at the same point. So someone has to determine uh, which of the transaction is the one that goes in first, and that one will be the one that will, is valid in the end. Uh, the transaction has a, well, I can increase the font size here. Uh -huh. So the transaction has a from field, uh, which is the sender, and a to field, which is the recipient, a value, the amount of ether that uh, is sent, and uh, a gas limit, uh, we will come to that later. Um, yeah, and now it says success here, uh, which means the transaction was included in a block. This is the number of the blocks. Blocks are numbered consecutively starting from, from zero. And um, when I click on the block now, I get information on the block. And it has a timestamp of 51 seconds ago. It includes 18 transactions, so 17 transactions apart from uh, the one I included. Uh, it has a hash. Uh, hashes are rather important in blockchains, but I think we will, will not be able to cover them. Um, it has a parent hash, which is, which is kind, of link, kind of a link to the previous block. And this is the address of the miner. The miner is awarded uh, by, yeah, zero ether in the testnet. Uh, and on the real net, the miner gets an actual reward for working on, yeah, participating in this random selection, which is a computation-intensive process. Um, yes, so I think that's, yeah, uncles are a complicated process which basically allow to reduce the block time from 10 minutes as it is in Bitcoin to 15 seconds as it is in Ethereum. And <clears throat> if you reduce the block time, then it's much more likely for this random selection process to kind of select two miners at the same time, and then they would produce two parallel blocks. And because of that, they would be conflicting in the same way as two parallel transactions from the same person would be conflicting. And yeah, this random selection process, this mining, uh, in the end will find a way to select one of these two parallel blocks as the canonical block. But this takes a while, so you want to reduce or yeah, increase the speed of the the blockchain network to converge on one of the alternatives, and uncles is a way to do that because, yeah, complicated. I mean, it's not too complicated, but perhaps a little bit too complicated for this workshop. So the person who requested the test and ether, did you get it? Who was it? 
Yep. Good. Now, um, yeah, let's. So perhaps also take a look. Let's take a look at this dashboard that you see when you go to ringkb.io. This views the current network. It has the current best block, so the, the, the block height, the block time, which is a diagram of how long it takes from one block to the next. This is a random process, which happens roughly every 15 seconds. So that's the reason for the, for the um, variation here. Uh, block propagation is a diagram that shows how the newly created blocks uh, are distributed inside the network. Um, yeah. Okay, then I will send some more. So this is done. So you probably need 0 0.001 ether for this workshop, so it would be fine if someone could help me distribute ether. This is Mark. Does it mean that someone is currently sending? Hmm. Yeah, that was faster than I expected. Okay. Only six addresses. That doesn't sound correct. Who has tested Ether now? Wow, nice. So I assume everyone is fine now. Um, oh, another address, okay. Someone is greedy, probably. Okay, so someone who still does not have Tesla Ether now, I think you can handle that in your, or in your tables locally. Okay, now um, Ether is only part of the fun. Of course, we can now send around Tesla Ether, which is already nice. Um, if it would be real Ether, we could use it to pay for whatever pizza. Um, but uh, of course, what we all came here for are smart contracts. And because there's so great support for it, we will still do a rather boring thing that smart contracts can be used for, and that is tokens. So this is almost the same as Ether, but still there are big differences because uh, you can create tokens with, uh, yeah, you can, when you create a new co token, you, determine what the mechanic will be, whether it will be a token that uh, is destroyed randomly uh, or where new tokens are created at certain points in time, whether it's some, some kind of thing that goes in the direction of a universal basic income or whether it's just ownership tokens or virtual kitties or whatever. Um, Okay, where are the instructions again? So let's take a look now at this example contract I put here, this simple contract. Um, <clears throat> this, for now, it's just source code. 
but we will create that as a smart contract on the blockchain. And for that, we use the IDE Remix, which is at remix.ethereum.org. Let me reload that. So that's a development environment for Solidity, uh, but it also, so where it's really strong is that it has an integra integrated execution environment, so it, it can create a virtual blockchain that only runs in your browser, where you can call functions and test the behavior of the smart contracts you write, then you can modify some part and uh, run it again. And you can also interface with the real blockchain and deploy stuff either on the test net or on the real network. We only have to wait for it to load. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, meant to use Firefox anyway. Are there any questions for now? I know you all really badly want to write smart contracts, but we have to wait for the website to load. What was the first smart contract you wrote? An empty one, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I created the compiler, so there was something to test. But I think, yeah, it didn't start with contracts. It, it just started with, with, with simple expressions. Uh, uh. Yeah, that is weird. Does it load for you? Yes, yes. Okay, then uh, perhaps start, huh? <coughs> Refresh. Yeah, I just did. <coughs> so perhaps start by pasting the simple contract source code that you have here. Uh, into the source code part. Uh, there is a rather complicated smart contract there by default. You can just erase that and replace it by this simple one. Yeah, I can explain some aspects just on the source code. So uh, this first line just tells the compiler or yeah, tells the compiler which version you want to have or which it should expect so that you aren't surprised by any breaking changes. And then you have this contract keyword, and that's a name for, your, for the contract you want to create. So one, uh, one tiny complication we have is that there's no, there are no two different words for a contract, a, a, yeah, a specific contract that is deployed on the blockchain, and the source code corresponding to that contract. Both is called contract. And the source code contract, there's only one, but you can have multiple copies of them multiple copies of the same source code on the on the blockchain. In programming terms, that would be distinct, the distinction between class and instance, but both is called contract for us. So. And um, so it has a variable here called stored number. Uh, this number is uh, permanently stored on the blockchain. And if you, so uint means it's an unsigned integer of 256 bits. That's the default. And uh, public means it will, the compiler would, will generate a function for you to, to read the value that is stored there. And uh, then you have a function called name, <coughs> which is public, which means it's accessible from outside. It is pure, which means it's not allowed to modify the blockchain state. And it returns a string. And what it returns is my GitHub username. And then you have another function, which, yeah, where now the interesting part starts. It's called stored number. It takes a parameter of type unsigned integer again, name x. It's publicly available. So 
which means everyone can call it. And what it does is it modifies the value of the number that is stored in this slot here. So you can write and you can use that function to store an arbitrary number inside the smart contract here. And because there's no access control here, everyone can call that. Everyone can modify the number. Okay, let's see if it, oh yeah, it's there. So let's try to run that. Uh, you can run that on Rinkeby, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think you now have to click start to compile or you can tick autocompile, then it autocompiles whenever you change something. Um, now, uh, if you click on details here, you can get some details about the contract. I'm not sure if we should dive into them at this point. Perhaps not. Um, and now the interesting part is when you go to the run tab here, because there you can uh, select uh, a contract in your source code, and when you click the red create button, it will create a transaction that will create the contract. Um, this selection at the top is very important because that uh, determines where the smart contract is created. If you select JavaScript VM, it will create it in a virtual blockchain just in your browser. If you select Injected Web 3, then it will create it on the Rinkeby testnet. And let's do this just for now. So if you click Create here, then the MetaMask plugin will pop up and will ask you to confirm it. It now it now has a different icon here because it creates a contract instead of just sending ether. And we can now click submit. And we will again get a pending transaction. Ah, damn it. Yeah, sorry. So this is the glitch I was talking about. If you use Firefox, then uh, the the browser will not properly work with uh, contract calls, so um, you have to go through here again. Click on the pending transaction, and then you will see this in the blockchain explorer. <clears throat> I will show you how it looks in Chrome. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, this smart contract will now be created at a certain address in Ethereum. So everything has addresses. We already talked about addresses because you got an address associated with a public-private key pair, and contracts also have an address. And when you want to interact with a contract, you have to know its address because that's where you send your transaction to. Okay, MetaMask already says it's confirmed. Etherscan does not say it's confirmed yet. Perhaps a reload will help. Nope. Ah, confirmed. So, and now it says contract created at this address. And here you can see the, yeah, the, the contract bytecode. So the, um, yeah, Ethereum uses a certain virtual machine called the virtual machine, which has a separate bytecode that is different from all other virtual machines. And this is its hexadecimal representation. Okay, now, it says contract created. We copy this address, or actually, let's let's just go there. I mean, you, you all did that in parallel, I guess. So you have different addresses there, of course, but that doesn't matter. Um, now, in this blockchain explorer, we have a different view because what we, the address we're now looking at is a contract address, um, which has a tab called code, where we can look at the code. Um, this doesn't help us very much. So that's the hexadecimal view, and that's the bytecode view, which is similar to some assembly code. And this is really annoying to look at. And because of that, uh, so, but we actually know the source code behind the smart contract there, and, uh, but Etherscan doesn't know this. So the, the centralized component here doesn't know it, only our browser knows it. But there's a way to tell it um, what the source code behind this uh, contract is. And this is always very useful to, to use. And you use this 
you, you get to that using this verify and publish link here in the code tab. Okay? Am I too fast? Am I too slow? Okay. Okay, so where are you? Excuse me? Which what? Which way did you use your injected web or? Ah, sorry, yeah. So I used uh, injected web, yes. So every one of you has this, the source code here. You copied it from the, from the instructions. Can I, get, can I see some hands? Okay, good. Now you select injected web here, which should be the default anyway. Then you click the red create button, MetaMask pops up, you confirm. So I'll do it again. Uh, so I click create here, then MetaMask pops up, I click submit. <clears throat> okay, now, okay. The step that was probably a bit too fast is how to get to the, um, to the other website here. So I just signed the transaction and the plugin disappeared again. So I, I open it up again and then there's at the, very, so the, the top entry is an entry that has these three dots or perhaps is already confirmed. But in any case, you click on this icon here, which will lead you to the Etherscan website. And it's, it's the website for the transaction. And the transaction should say contract created with a green mark. Okay, question? Yes, the find similar contracts. Have I just repeat your question? Yeah, so, um, we're just thinking actually find your contract, right? Yeah. Um, so, we have yes, so, I didn't uh, verify it yet. So, the question was whether, so, Etherscan has a uh, functionality where it can find contracts with the same source code automatically or semi-automatically. And the question was why is this not working in this case now? And the reason is I did not upload my source code yet to Etherscan. At least that's what I think is the reason. Okay, now you click on the contract address. And you see a transaction, so the, the creation transaction of the contract. You see who created it. So as I said earlier, every transaction, every message in Ethereum always has a sender. It's always authenticated. And you, yeah, even the contract creation has a kind of origin. Okay, now you click on the code tab. And then on verify and publish. So did I still lose someone? Okay, verify and publish. Let's click on that. Okay, now we get to a very complicated website which will hopefully get simpler by a compiler feature we hopefully will be able to release soon. So what you do is, the address should already be correct. Um, you paste your source code into the bottom part here. So we all paste our own, uh, the same source code, unless somebody modified the string here, perhaps. Perhaps next time. <clears throat> okay, we paste the thing here. We, so because a single source file can contain multiple contracts, we have to specify the name here. Oh, my named account. 
By the way, this is just a stupid example. Uh, don't read too much into it. And then you have to select the compiler. Um, this is most probably v0423 plus something. So um, the compilers with nightly should not be used for such things. Only the one that start, yeah, that have commit directly. Check again by going back to Remix. <coughs> Sorry. And under settings, or here at the top, uh, there should be the compiler version in the address bar. Okay, and oh yeah, optimization is the second setting we need to check. So we still have to go to settings. Um, yeah, and enable optimization is probably turned off. I think it will also appear in the address bar. Oh yeah, optimize false. So if optimizes false here, then uh, you have to switch optimization from yes to no. So these, huh? That's just whether the compiler. Uh, should do some optimizations. So to make the code faster and cheaper without ch changing its semantics. And so <clears throat> what we're doing here is um, we're, so Etherscan is checking whether the source code we provide here matches the bytecode stored on the blockchain. And it is important that it's, so it is impossible to fake that. Um, so it's, if, so if I could just change the, the name of this function here, or even worse, if I could change uh, this x to two, then this function would do something else than I thought. And um, by, yeah, due to some reasons, it's impossible to provide the incorrect, it's impossible to provide a different source code here but it's not possible to recover the source code from the bytecode. So the bytecode loses information because it's much more compact, um, but it still contains a hash of the source code. And uh, what they do is they just recompile the source code we provide here with the settings, and if, the same, if it results in the same bytecode, then they say that is the source code. Okay, and the rest here can be ignored for now. And yeah, it's a centralized service, so it uses other centralized services. Mm. Yeah, that didn't work. Let's try again. Did it work for someone else? Did you change? Did you have any other settings? Let's just try again. Okay, now it worked. So um, now it just, this is a confirmation uh, s uh, page now. And when we go back, hmm? I just retried, I don't know. How did you get to this website? 
um, you go to the, you click on the code tab and then this link is here. So now if I, if I reload this website, it should show me the source code, so let's see. Yep, yeah, so when I click on code now, we have the actual source code here. It is verified, exact match, everything is fine. And now, uh, so one thing before I get to the question is, now we have a read code, read contract tab, where we can interact with the smart contract. For example, it, it calls the name function for us and displays the string that it returns. These are very, yeah, yeah, this is not a very nice interface to, interface with the smart contract. We can do the same thing from Remix, which I will show you next. But there were some questions. Yes. Uh, if everybody here creates exactly the same contract, we will get a different contract ID or, or we will get a nice So everyone will create, so the bytecode, so if you don't change the source code, you use the same compiler version and the same settings, then everyone will get exactly the same bytecode. So uh, basically, yeah, I think I can't switch back to, ah, okay. So this should be exactly the same for every one of us. But what is different is the sender address. The person that signed the transaction to create the contract and the, the address at which the new contract is created is determined from the sender address. And because of that, everyone will get a different smart contract in the sense that a smart contract at a different address, but it will be identical, con identical copies of the same contract. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean by contract ID. In the transaction that creates the contract, like this, right? It says, okay, transaction from me to whatever, right? Contact were created. Yes, that's the address. But this is the, the that instance is, of the contract. That's the, the, yeah, the, the address at which the instance is located. Okay, so yeah. each of us will have a different one. Yes. And the yes. bytecode ID, like the ID of the is, the, is there? That is that the, the same for everyone. So the bytecode is the same for everyone. Ah, okay. Is but there the, an ID for the bytecode? It's, it's just the byte bite string. Okay. So you can, you can take a look. If you click the link. Yeah. Or that, that's the same. That's the, I mean, that's not the, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to go back from the bytecode to solidity? Or from ABI? I want to, like, it's I compressed know. information. You can only go, you can, prove that you went the way, and that way you can go back. But you can't, if you don't know the source code, there's usually no way to go back, because it involves hash functions and... <clears throat> okay, so now let's do some interesting stuff. Um, okay. People who uh, used Chrome, for them that will be automatic and everyone else, or at least for Firefox, we have to do that manually. Uh, what we do next is we copy the address of the smart contract. Yep. How do uh, 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 It's in the URL of Remix. We copy the smart contract address, we go back to Remix. We click on the Run tab. And uh, people using Chrome, they will have something here. And due to a glitch in the connection between Firefox and the MetaMask plugin, we have to do that manually. And what we have to do is we have to paste the address here into the input box next to the Add address button, and then we click Add Address. And that basically tells Remix, hey, at this specific address on the blockchain, there is a contract of the type that was just selected here. And by that, Remix provides us with an interface to, to interact with the smart contract. It creates one button for every public function that we can call.
So this add address button is always a little bit confusing. Um, create creates a transaction actually creating smart contract, and add address just uh, tells Remix to to display an interface to you that allows you to interact with a pre-existing smart contract. So, um, so the create, uh, allow you to specifically just the smart contract? Or does it actually run the smart contract? So the create button does not run method. It's, it just creates the smart contract. So any question for this step? To, was it again too fast? Yeah? What are we doing this for? Just to, to check if the contract is closed? The, the loading? Why are we loading the contract? What do you mean? Why are we using this add address button? Or? Yeah. So we're using this add address button to get this interface here below. If you use Chrome, then you already have it, because it will be created automatically. Are that's for interaction with contract? Yes. There can be multiple of these here, and depending on what you selected here in the top. Uh, uh, that's how it's named. Doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So the. So the question was about the contract address and what it is. It has nothing to do with the block. It is just, so an address of an account you create that is not a smart contract, that is derived from the public key of your public-private key pair. And for smart contracts, the address is derived from, yeah, basically from the, from the account that created the smart contract. So the account that created the smart contract and the nonce that is incremented with each transaction. And at that address, the data is stored. Addresses are, so blocks are a dimension of time and addresses are kind of a dimension of space. So they are unrelated to each other. So blocks are just there to group transactions and order transactions. So they determine in which order changes are applied to the blockchain. And addresses determine where data is stored, where changes can be applied. So of course a smart contract is created in a certain, a certain block, so it starts existing from a certain block, but uh, yeah, that... So the byte code of the smart contract logic is stored in the block? No. So the transaction that created the smart contract, which kind of includes, so the, the byte code of the smart contract is part of the transaction that creates the smart contract, and that transaction is part of the block, but you can't really say that the, the final smart contract code is stored in the block. The, it is stored in the blockchain at an address, unrelated to blocks. Okay, and um, now, so we have this interface here, we can click buttons. Blue buttons are buttons which do not cause a change in the blockchain. They just read from the blockchain. Because of that, they are free of charge and are executed instantly. So you don't need to confirm the transaction with MetaMask. And if I click name, it says Chris F and stored number is probably zero, yes. But as soon as I click a red button, and I can give an argument for the function store number here. Let's use 17. And we click store number, then we'll execute this function here with argument of 17, which means that it stores 17 in the stored number here. I click the button, MetaMask will pop up, ask me for confirmation, I confirm. <clears throat> Now we have to wait for the transaction to be included.
Okay, on the left here it says transaction was included. And uh, now when I click store number again, it reevaluates the function, it should say 17, so let's check. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, is it more or less clear how to interact with, with smart contracts now using this interface? Okay, um, yeah, just out of curiosity, there are these buttons here, details and debug. Um, if you click debug, then you will get to the second big feature of Remix, which is a debugger. Um, you can run that on any transactions, where they are, so yeah, older transactions, so it, it's, not, it's not a debugger that executes and you can stop it at some point. It's more like an execution inspector, so you can rerun and so there's, there's actually a slider which represents time that you can run back and forth. Um, yeah, but let's not get too deep into that. Okay, um, now let's go to the next stage and create a token. Mm. So there's the second contract that was linked. Um, now we'll do it in a different way and this time I will create the smart contract and you will use it. So, yeah. Again? What determines the cost of this operation? So Can you speak louder please? Yes, sorry. I had to pay something, right, to send my, my integer. To yes. My what what the what what is hmm? what determines the the cost of that? Who decide how much do I have to pay for it? You decide. So the the question was so yeah what I didn't uh, tell much earlier because we use it on the test net is so when you want some execution to be performed when you want to create a smart contract when you when you want to cause any permanent change in the blockchain. You have to pay people for doing that. So the, the network doesn't run on its own. Uh, you have to pay for things to be done. And <clears throat> this is paid in a, in a unit called gas. Gas more or less measures the amount of computation required. And then there's the second factor called the gas price. This means how much you are willing to pay per unit of gas. And this is something you set when you create the transaction. It's not too visible in MetaMask, I think. It kind of determines that on its own. but. Uh, in other interfaces, you sometimes have a slider where you can select to either pay more or pay less. If you pay more, then your transaction will be included earlier. If you pay less, it's cheaper, but it will take longer for your transaction to be included. And it might even happen that your transaction is never included. That's kind of how, it's work, how it works. Did that answer your question? Okay. So, um, yeah, let me create the smart contract. I will verify the source code. And then I will share the address with you and we will interact with it. Yeah, I just wrote that smart contract in the afternoon, didn't test it yet. Let's hope it works. <clears throat> so now it looks like MetaMask doesn't work, so let's do it again in Firefox. It looks like Chrome isn't better.
So that's the creation of the weird token contract. <clears throat> we can already take a look at it. Um, So the weird token has a name, it's called weird token. It has a symbol, which is a short version of its name. It has decimals, which we can ignore. And the most important thing is this mapping called balances. <clears throat> and this kind of holds the, for every possible address, it holds the amount of token that is assigned to that address. So this is kind of the balance sheet of this token system. And it's a total, it also has a total supply, which is the, um, the amount, the, the overall amount of tokens, so the sum of all tokens, the sum of all balances. <clears throat> we have a function called balance off that takes an address and can be used to read the balance at that address. And we have a function called transfer, which takes a two address and a value. And uh, yeah, what does the transfer function do? It checks whether the person that wants to send, to, to send tokens has enough balance, so has at least a certain value. Um, I already said that all transactions have a sender and you can access this sender using msg.sender here. That's a special value in Solidity which yeah, can be used to access the sender of a transaction or more specifically the caller of a function. So transfer, so you, you can perhaps see that transfer has no authentication part. So it doesn't ask whether the person, so whether someone is, is allowed to transfer tokens. And the reason is uh, because every transaction is signed, it is already authorized by the signer. So when you send a transaction, you always have to authorize. So by accessing msg.sender, this already means that the sender has authorized the transaction, so the sender has authorized the transfer of the tokens by invoking that function. And <clears throat> This is something I really like about Ethereum because you don't have to think about, yeah, who can do that and do I have to ask for a password or something. This is all abstracted away in the, in the cryptography below. In the smart contract level, you just ask for who does this, who wants to do something, and if they want to do something, then of course they, yeah, you can check if they are allowed to do that, but you don't have to check if they are actually that person. So transfer works by the person invoking the function, asking to transfer a certain amount to a certain address. <clears throat> so we check that the person has at least that balance. And if that is the case, then we reduce that person balances, person's balance by that value, and we add the same value to the recipient. And we emit, a fun emit, a, yeah, we emit an event to tell our environment that something happened. <clears throat> Now, uh, I'll get back to the two functions below in a second. Let's just check whether the transaction succeeded. Okay, now the address. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll add that to the HackMD and to the other one. Yeah, someone was faster. Wow. Okay, um, I also added here. So what you do now is you use this add address function to tell Remix where 
the token is. Okay, I will remove that here and <clears throat> Okay, now we have this nice token contract. Um, Please use, please paste the address here and use add address. Make sure that you selected weird token. Um, and then, yeah, make sure that you have this interface here. Um, please do not use your own instance of the weird token because you want to use, all of us want to use the same token, of course. So now you probably ask yourself, how do I get one of these shiny new weird tokens, right? Now let's take a look at the two functions below here. <clears throat> and this create token uh, functions already sounds like it would create tokens, um, but it's marked internal, which means it cannot be called from outside. Uh, what it does is increases the balance of the sender by one token and also the total amount, uh, total number of tokens in existence. Um, but as I said, it cannot be called from outside. But it is called, it is called from here, inside the request token mathematically function. And um, that is a public function, so that's good. But it starts with two require statements. And if the, if, the, if the argument inside the require statement is false, then this will cause the transaction to be reverted. So it will, it will stop executing and revert any effects it might have had. <clears throat> so you have to think of a way to make this condition true. So multiple of 17 has to be zero modulo 17 and number used at multiple of 17 has to be false. And you invoke this request token mathematically function by, of course, clicking this um, red button here. <coughs> and I fear that if you just click the red button now, the first person who does that will get a token. Can someone explain why? So the, the thing is, we don't do, uh, or Jan, do we do input checking here? If you just leave this input box empty, it will use zero as value, right? Yeah. So if you leave this empty and just press the red button here, it will use zero for multiple of 17. And what will happen inside the smart contract here when multiple of 17 is zero? Yeah, I mean, this module is a bit complicated, perhaps, for people who are not used to that. Um, it checks whether a multiple of 17 is a multiple of 17, so a, a, and a integer multiple of 17. So 0 times 17, 1 times 17, 2 times 17, 3 times 17, and so on. And 0 seems to be 0 times 17, so this check passes. And the second check is just, so everything is false by default. So this reference is the, the mapping here, and this is just a means to say that no two numbers can be used twice. So if you used multiple of 17 once, then this is set to true, and if someone does use the same number later, it will stop here because uh, that will no longer be true. Question? Am I right in saying that two people pick the same number, but one person gives a much higher gas price than the one that you get the token? 
Um, so the question was, if two people use the same number at the same time, but one gives a higher gas price, that person is more likely to get the token? It depends. So um, it depends on the miners. I think they currently sort transactions by gas costs, but I'm not, so it might also be, so this is a test net, there things might also be a little bit different. But uh, you're probably right, yes. So the person that uses a higher gas cost is more likely to get the token, I think. <clears throat> But also, I mean, it really depends on timing. I mean, if the miner is not aware of the second transaction yet, but the but is aware of the first transaction already, then and is yeah, it's a so it's a decentralized network, so you cannot predict anything about timing. That's that's the whole thing that blockchain solve. So, and because this is a token, um, and it implements the so-called ERC-20 standard, uh, blockchain explorers have special support for that. And we can use that support by telling uh, Etherscan that this is actually an ERC-20 token. I will do that now. Um, I think I just have to reload. So Etherscan will notice that this is an ERC-20 token as soon as this uh, event is fired. Oh yeah, it already did. So it automatically recognized that it's an ERC-20 token and we click here now, we will get more information about the tokens. Yeah, we already have 12 addresses that have tokens and we can get a list of all token holders one token holder is already quite wealthy. <clears throat> and yeah, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we can see which numbers were already used. I mean, of course, we can. Um, I know it's not publicly visible. Yeah, we can take a look at the. Oh, no, we can't take a look. We have to look at the transactions, and there we can see which numbers are used, I think. Yeah, we have to click on the transaction. That's, that's not too convenient, but... Um, yeah, it's here, one CB in hex, that is a number. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. The question was, can we make the token visible in MetaMask? And I think so, yes. You just have to uh, copy the contract address, the token contract address, then click on MetaMask. And then you switch to the token tab here. So there's a send tab and the token tab. And you click on add token. You enter the token contract address, so you paste. It automatically loads the token symbol. And then we click add, and it will say that I have zero tokens. <coughs> yeah, that's a different token. Um, so let me get some of these tokens too. I don't think so. Okay, how do I secretly come up with a multiple of 17 <laughs> before you realize? Um, <laughs> ah, come on! So we have 256 bits, right? So. So if you have larger numbers here, then you put them in quotes. Okay. 
larger than the precision uh, for JavaScript. How large is the unsigned integer? 256 bits. 256 bits. Again, please. This is 32 bytes in storage. You can choose to use a smaller one by putting the number of bits after the uint. So uint 80, for example. Oops. But it, there's no big ad advantage in using smaller numbers because the Ethereum virtual machine has so that the default data type for the Ethereum virtual machine is 256 bit integers. Everything smaller has to add additional operations to make it work for the smaller size. It, is a, it might be an advantage in storage sometimes, so if you want to store many small numbers, it might be an advantage, but you have to try. So basically the registers are 256 bits? Yes. You can't use them for subscripts? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Array. Uh, for array index. Uh, I don't know you can't. That I wouldn't also see a reason for that. OK. So let's see if I got some. <clears throat> yeah, nice. Test that works. <laughs> okay, any questions? The question is, so in the weird token, we change the balances uh, of the sender and the receiver, and then the, we emit an event. And the question was, what is the event for? Yes. The event is uh, because it makes it easier for outside viewers to see what happens. If they want to see, so uh, events are stored at a certain place, which is much easier accessible. If we wouldn't have events, everyone would have to rerun uh, the execution and basically look inside the execution and see what happens. And with events, you can just take a look at the blockchain itself and, uh, yeah, notice that something happened. Okay, but, but it makes it like, more transparent? Or, like, just for... Does it make it more transparent? No, it's more like easier searchable. Okay. Yeah? So why does Etherscan recognize the concept of token? No. This is MetaMask as the concept of token in the UI. Yeah. And in fact, we recognize that there's a concept of token in my contract, but there's a contract I so, so the question is, how does MetaMask see the concept? How does it know that this contract represents a token? Yes. I mean, you just told it it is a token. You set new token at that address. Right? This, this is just random code that I broke. So the, yeah, but I mean, <clears throat> so the, the minimum requirements for a token is uh, this transfer function that will be called, uh, okay, I mean, why we added this token, to perhaps just. Yes, yes. So why we added uh, the token to MetaMask is that because now we can actually transfer tokens directly. At least I thought. Um, okay. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, it looks like MetaMask doesn't support that, yeah. So many Ethereum wallets support also transferring tokens automatically. It looks like MetaMask only supports displaying that, displaying them. But uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But the Going back to your question, so the minimum requirement for a token contract is this transfer function. 
and the balance off function. And perhaps the name, but yeah, the balance off function require, allows you to query your balance, and the transfer function allows you to transfer tokens. <clears throat> and then we also have this event here, this transfer event, which is also useful to, so that you don't have to search the full blockchain all the time. That's all we need. And if that's there in the contract, then it is a token. <coughs> I mean, so having said that, of course, the fact that we have a function called transfer doesn't automatically mean that the transfer function also transfers tokens. We can, we can put whatever we want here inside the code. So we can say if it's a Sunday, then uh, all, transfer, all, all transfer functions will send token to a special address. And if it's a Monday, half of them are burned. And on all other days, we have correct transfers. We can, we can, we can emulate the, the, the existing traditional banking system and say transfers on Sunday are not allowed. Nice. <laughs> so the question was... So the question event... <laughs> The question was whether the transfer event executes any logic. Uh, no, I mean, uh, it's just, it's just, it stores this data you supply in a special data, sto data structure that is easily accessible from outside, but does not execute any code. Okay, now our next task. Uh, try to get more than one token in a single transaction. So for now, we just click this red button and we have to find a new multiple of 17 and we get one token in return. Okay? Is there a way to click a red button and get more than one token in return? I'll give you a hint. Uh, it will require a little bit more than copy pasting. Uh, I mean, yeah, so more than one of this, these tokens, so from this contract. No, the contract stays the same. We use exactly the same contract. <clears throat> we what? Oh, it's not an exploit. I mean, so request token mathematically uh, publishes one token for every conceivable multiple of 17. So, so the exact task is, is there a way to click a red button here in Remix? So to execute a state changing function on some smart contract, which will then award you with more than one to more than one of these weird tokens in return. Yes, very good. So we have to write our own smart contract that calls request token mathematically on the token contract, and of course multiple times. And yes, the difficult task is coming up with smart with with code that kind of finds multiples of 17 in a different way than in the way all others in the room do it. So let's let's try to find. Uh, so I will show you how a very simple contract that does that looks like. So I click on this plus this plus button on the top left. <clears throat> and now, okay, what is a bit annoying? Okay, <clears throat> actually, yeah, don't click the red, don't click the plus button. It's much easier to just add another smart contract below the 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 weird token. So just add something below here. <clears throat> Uh, 
And so the, the most important thing is that uh, this new smart contract needs to know the address of the weird token smart contract because it needs to interact with it. And I do that by What was the addressing? Was it this one here? Oh, here. So you, if you still have it here, you can just click here on this button to copy the address into the clipboard. <clears throat> and then you paste it here. Okay, we have an error here. Yeah, okay. We can't use that address. Jan, can I file an issue? Did you see the error message here? Should it be a string? string can, can you encode it in the checksum with correct checksum? Mm, no. Why not? Okay, so yeah, addresses in Ethereum have some checksum which, is, which uses upper and lower case of hexadecimal letters. And actually it, yeah, if you click on compile here, they actually should show how the correct checksum looks like. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, I will paste that somewhere. Sorry about that. Yeah. But it's also not checksummed. Ah, here it is, okay. Oof. So this is the address with checksum because it has an uppercase FE here and the lowercase E. I just can't copy it because the browser does weird things. Okay. Okay, now we need to tell <clears throat> the compiler that we actually think that this is really a weird token at this address. So, but, so this is the most complicated part. Um, okay, I'll put that in the HackMD. Okay, now what we do is function get token public and now we call weird token dot request token mathematically. And the most important thing now, so if we only do it like that, then of course I know this multiple of 17 is already taken, but uh, more importantly, um, we're token will generate a token, but the token will be assigned to this smart contract. So it will not belong to our account, but it will belong to the account of the fountain contract. Okay, because the fountain contract called request token mathematically and we're token assigns tokens to whoever called request token mathematically. So what we need to do is, as a second step, send the token back one step further to the caller of the fountain. So we're token.transfer 
msg.sender and one token. <clears throat> so okay, one, one other complication that arises here. msg.sender in this context, at this point here, and msg.sender at, at this point here, so the person that gets, uh, sorry, at this point here, these are two different values. They always represent the caller of the current function. And if we call two functions after each other, then this, of course, changes. Inside the fountain, this is us calling get token. But inside weird token, it is fountain calling weird token. So was everyone able to copy that contract? Did you get this weird, this thing where... So if you have any red marks here on the left, it means there's a compiler error, so something's wrong. If you do not have any marks and you have a fountain in green here, then it should be fine. Okay, let's see what happens when I create that contract. So make sure that, that you select the correct uh, contract here that you want to create. Do you really need randoms? Well, I need something different from the other. So, best randomness is produced by the outside. So um, I just created this fountain contract and now I click on the get token button and I get this message here. This is very bad UX uh, because it just means that uh, something failed. <laughs> so it means one of these require statements here failed. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. The reason why it probably failed is because my number was already taken. But I want to know the failure before I have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, okay, let, let's, send it, let's send it anyway. And then we can, oh, we can check in the debugger and see where it failed. <clears throat> But 
But the debugger won't catch the source code correctly, right? Because I, modif I added the contract here. Etherscan also has a debugger. Can check there. <clears throat> No, but yeah, Jan, we already have a pull request pending that displays an IC formatted error, right? I mean, we have this, yeah. it's perhaps not in gas estimation, but yeah, that will improve soon. By the way, so whenever you see tooling lacking here, uh, and you can program, there are tons of grant programs where you can just apply with an idea, uh, get some money, and improve the Ethereum ecosystem. So I think there are at least three different grant programs that are happy to give you money to work on improving the ecosystem. So there's this, I think it's called ETH Price. there's the Ethereum Community Fund, and there's also the Ethereum Foundation Development Grant Program. Yeah, okay, oh, that's nice. So Etherscan now tells me it, this transaction failed. And now the only reason, so I want to know why it failed. Let's see whether I can get some information there. <clears throat> yeah, so Etherscan has a debugger, as I said, so you can click on tools and utilities here. And click on remix debugger. This will use more or less the same debugger we already saw. I think it's an older version, right, Jan? Yeah, I think that's quite tricky to get. <clears throat> yeah, they haven't even implemented return data copy, return data size, they don't know revert. They really have to update their version. <clears throat> okay. Um, So I think we have to close the workshop in 15 minutes and go to the fun stuff that involves liquids, right? <laughs> um, has anyone succeeded in, in getting more than one token? How many? And what did you use? So 163 transactions. Oh, you also see whether that transaction failed uh, in the transaction list here. This is weird. <coughs> Eight hundred, wow.
think we're spamming the network quite. Oh no, someone is spamming the network. This is all the same address. No, it's the same transaction hash. Okay, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's an event for creating a single token inside the weird token smart contract, which gets an entry for every single creation, and then the final transfer of 100 is a single thing. Yeah, okay. Mm. <clears throat> Nice, nice. So shall I show you an example of how to get multiple tokens? Okay, how to get randomness? Next question, just provided from outside. I mean, it, it doesn't have the source code, so it's. So that's just. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what we could do is just copy that 10 times. Okay, so first of all, um, we just multiply that by a second number we provide when we create the transaction. Oh, the interface is really slow. So. The question was whether state variables are by default public or private. They are private by default, but that of course does not mean that they are secret. So everyone can read everything that is on the blockchain. and just select a random number here, then this will still be multiples of 17, and uh, someone can only outrun me by taking a look at the pending transactions, or taking a look at the screen here. Um, so, let's do that. Okay, create the contract. Sorry, what is the question? So the question is whether the require only concerns the current function or whether it's cascading. 
I'm not sure what you mean. So it's, it's executed every single time. It's just a normal statement. <clears throat> ah, right. So if a require fails, everything will fail. So So if the yeah if if one of these has already been taken, then I will receive nothing. So and due to two reasons actually. So the first reason is that because uh, a failing require here uh, reverts the whole thing. But even if it wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be able to send ten tokens to me here. Yeah. Okay, let's see if that worked. Yep. So try to copy that. So if you're greedy, you perhaps replace this 10 by 100. Um, that wasn't the best idea because I think it will not work. <laughs> um, and the reason is, I already said earlier, that you have to pay for everything. And uh, the reason for that is if you don't, then you can easily spam the blockchain. You can just request a very expensive operation to be performed, and that would take a long time. And time is the important thing here because uh, there's an upper limit on how much can be done inside a single block, inside a single transaction. And uh, if you want to do more, so yeah, there's just an upper bound. You can't do more than a certain thing inside a transaction. It, this upper bound is kind of flexible. It, it changes over time but it's a hard upper bound. So if you change this to 100 or, I mean, at least for 1,000 it will certainly fail. And so, yeah, of course the solution to do that is to break it up into multiple transactions or one solution. So, okay, this was confirmed. Let's see how many tokens I have now. Yeah, it worked, 13. Good, so I hope you learned some thing about smart contracts here. Yeah, question? How is it possible to not do the weird brackets after the form? So, because he throws me an error if I do it exactly like that. And if I put brackets, or just the, the one Can you see it? Yeah. Also, if I put the Klammern in the then... What is the failure? Also, if you don't set it. If I don't set it? No, because it should make no difference. Actually, this mold is not known. You have to have an argument. Also, get token, you have to define a few meters. This mold exists not. This will be given? Yes. Okay, that's what I have to ask. Das ist kein, genau. äh, kein Random Number, Number nee, Generator nee, nee. oder so. Nee. Okay, I got you. <coughs> yep. Supply, I, so it starts with zero and it increases for every token that is created. It starts with zero. So total supply is not a fixed number. It changes every time a token is created. But you can, uh, you can fix it. Uh, I mean, you can uh, set a certain number of... It is your token. You can do whatever you want. So, if so currently it's unlimited. You can generate an unbounded number of tokens with this smart contract. So as I said, I mean, token does not, does not necessarily mean that it's money. So token is just something that can be transferred. And yeah, this certainly is not money because it's very easy to get new tokens. Are there more questions? Okay. Uh, 
that doesn't identify is not unique. Ich frage nicht nur der Identifier von Intuition oder von einer übergebenen Variable. Ja, kannst du mal kurz einfach nur ein Leerzeichen irgendwo einfügen, dass es dann kompiliert wird, das sieht irgendwie komisch aus. Das kann natürlich sein, ja. Ah, es kann sein, dass Mull reserviert ist. Jetzt hat es geklappt. Ja, okay. Dann muss, man, muss ich hier umschalten, damit er nochmal kompiliert. Danke. Gerne. Okay, any more questions? Ja. Yeah. Let's assume we can do it like a 10,000 times. Like, uh, I'm just curious how you are dividing into a, like a smaller transaction. Like, uh, you said it will fail for like a 1,000. Let's assume I need for 10,000. Is there some pattern that one can use and then have it like a split it into the blocks, this like an operation? Yeah. In that case, how one will revert if it's going to fail in the later stages? So the question is, if you have a longer operation, how do you split it up into multiple transactions so that it fit into, fits into the blocks? I mean, in this case, it's, it's trivial because, I mean, it already, you can already split it up by just choosing a number and then running it multiple times. How, like but if, it's, it's, fail, if the result of the first part is important for the second part, then it's more tricky. I think there's no generic pattern, but you just have to save the state okay, that's the question. and then continue on from there. And then if it's failed, then revert it back if it's needed again manually. I'm just curious. I guess like a first portion passed, the second one failed. So it's not a separate block, so I need to come and back and then divide So it if some of the steps fail, you just start over from the last successful one. Okay, so everything should be done manually then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. How can I inspect the current value of the mapping? Of which of the number used? No, no. no of which no, mapping? Ah, oh, okay, also this, but I was talking, uh, referring to the, 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 the balances. The balances. Um, so you can't. So f for a mapping, uh, so mappings are yeah infinite in size, kind of. They allow. So you can't really get a full list of everything. There are ways, but it's difficult. But if you know, you can look at certain points in the mapping. And you can use, just use these blue buttons for that. So even on the block space, you cannot iterate on the, all the values. You can only check the, the value of what you So you certain ca certainly cannot iterate over all the values inside a smart contract. But there are ways to iterate over it from outside in a certain way. But the problem is, so the, the keys you put inside the mapping, they are hashed. And what you certainly will never get is the actual values of the keys. It's a hash map. It's a hash map, yes. So I basically cannot eat the page. No. So Solidity is a very low level language. And uh, it has to be extremely gas efficient because otherwise you can't do most of the operations on the blockchain. And because of that, mappings are the yeah, simplest thing you can think of that resembles a key value store. If you also store the keys together with the values, it's already much more expensive. And that's why it's not done. But you can build your own user-defined data type on top of mapping that also stores the keys. How reliable is this mapping? If, if there's a hash condition on, on two different keys, would the value be? It's a SHA-256, and so it's a SHA-3 hash with 32 bytes. So there's but, practically no collision. So, I see. But there's the risk of that. It's not like the real hash, key, uh, hash map that has a linked list for every hash no, map. No, no, there are, yeah, it's not, it's not like a hash map where you cope with collisions. It's a hash map that uses that large hash value where you hope that there will never be a collision. So if you have a collision in, in the balances mapping, then the whole blockchain is screwed because it uses the same 
hash function. And if that has any collision, then it's already too late. If guess estimation failed, then this usually means that one of the requires failed. One of the requires? So you did something that was not allowed. So, for example, you ran one of your numbers was already taken. Ah, that's a good yeah. question. Genau. Das ja. Es soll viel besser geworden sein. Ja, vor allem kann man ja Lightsync benutzen. Das, das geht ja dann. Lightsync kann man ja benutzen. Das geht ja instantan dann. Bis man zum ersten Mal durch ist. Aber nee, nee, instantan. Geht danach auch bei Also Light Mode geht instantan. Ich, ich bin noch im Stream, ne? <lacht> ja. <lacht> so, I think we'll end the official part now. Uh, I'm not sure what the agreements with the venue are actually, so I think we can still stay, but uh, yeah, I guess let's end the live stream. So, yeah. <laughs>